Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone was able to, uh, to ride out these storms that we had without uh, too much difficulty. I know some, some folks were affected uh, kind of serious, uh, seriously. I saw some videos of boats floating down canals and, and things, and I thought, boy, I'm just, here I am, a new boat owner. I'm just grateful I don't live on the water. <laughs> I heard a story about one time Billy Graham was in an airplane on a trip and the airplane got in a really terrible storm and it's shaking, it's going up and down and left and right and he's just sitting there all stoic, smiling, reading the Bible. And the lady next to him, she was terrified. And she goes, Reverend Graham, can't you do something about this? And he quietly and nicely said, no ma'am, I can't. I'm not in management, I'm in sales. <laughs> Hey, you accepted the invitation, right? So. <laughs> okay, who here has ever heard of a black swan? Right? Do you know there was a time when people didn't know black swans existed? All the way up to 1697, no one believed there was such a thing as a black swan. And then some Dutch uh, travelers, they found a black swan in Australia. And it caught everybody off by surprise. So now that term black swan, which refers to being caught off guard, something that you never expected to happen, has become a thing. They actually call things black swan events now. So a black swan is an event is something that no one really saw coming. They got caught off guard. A black swan event is usually something very catastrophic, and they're like, Oh my. Now we've all lived through many black swan events. Well, some of you who remember black swan events back to the, the Great Depression. That was a black swan. World War I. The war to end all wars. That was a black swan event. And of course, so was World War II. That wasn't supposed to happen with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Black swan events. We've all lived through some of those, the 2008 financial crisis, 9-11, that was a black swan, COVID pandemic, we all remember that one. You know, the Bible has a lot of black swan events it talks about. The flood, the great flood with Noah. Even Noah didn't know the full magnitude of what was happening. He didn't know why he was building the ark. Only God knew the plan. When Moses got to the Red Sea, he stood there and he saw the chariots coming and God turned him around and opened the sea. A black swan event. No one saw that coming. And outside the city of Jericho, they sounded the trumpets and marched around the city for seven days and suddenly the walls came tumbling down. That was a black swan event. No one could have predicted that was going to happen. Black swan events are those rare <clears throat> occurrences of something that happens that no one expected and it has significant consequences. Now, there's another kind of event. It has a fun name. It's called the gray rhino. And there's actually a thing called the gray rhino effect. <clears throat> a gray rhino is something that's highly probable, but it's massively impactful and no one seems to care. Gray rhinos are very common, but you just never know when you're going to see one. You never know when you're going to be in the presence of a gray rhino. I'm sorry. You do know when you're in the presence of the gray rhinos coming, you hear them charging. But the problem is, is uh, even though everyone can anticipate a gray rhino event, no one seems to do anything about it. They don't know when it's going to happen, so they just ignore the warning. Everyone knows it's going to be really bad, but they just pretend it's not coming. We can find a lot of gray rhinos in the Bible. 
Jeremiah, he warned all the people of Judah that the Babylonians were coming. You're going to be taken away in captivity. They ignored him. What happened? They got taken away in captivity. Elijah told the people of Judah, this is God's warning to you. The altars in Jerusalem will be demolished. I will slay your people in front of your idols. They ignored him. The first temple was destroyed. They knew it was coming. Even Jesus gave the warning to the second temple. He said that the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. The Jewish leaders decided they were just going to ignore the warning for 40 years. And the walls of the second temple came tumbling down. So that brings us back to gray rhinos and black swans. One's very predictable, the other one's completely unpredictable. So I have to ask the question, what kind of world do we live in mostly? A predictable one or unpredictable? I, I think we live in a pretty predictable world. I mean, what, what do we have more often, terrorist attacks or floods? Yeah, we can predict a flood, can't we? I want to talk about a flood. You know, the Bible contains about 15 references to flooding events, and those don't even include the, the big flood, the Noahic flood. And in Psalms, floods represent God's judgment. In Daniel and Revelation, floods are used to uh, give you imagery for the end times. Even uh, Matthew, Luke, and Peter talk about floods. It's because flood stories are a great way to make a point, so I'm going to tell you a flood story. Now, my flood story is not from the Bible. It begins in North Boston at the turn of the 19th century. Actually, 20th, 1900s. <laughs> You know what I mean. <laughs> the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, they owned a massive facility for storing, of all things, molasses. It turns out, during World War I, molasses was a crucial ingredient for the production of industrial alcohol. And that little tower it was massive. It was uh, 50 feet wide, no, 90 feet wide, 50 feet high, and it held 2.1 million gallons of sticky, gooey molasses. For years, that storage tank, it just stood proudly up on the hill. The facility gave jobs to all the people in the area. But on a cold morning in January of 1919, that enormous tank suddenly burst open and a towering wave of molasses went crashing down through the streets of North Boston. One eyewitness, Isaac Gonzalez, was working nearby and he recalled, I heard a tremendous noise like a roar of an oncoming train and when I turned to look I saw a massive wave of what looked like dark syrup rushing towards me. It was at least 25 feet tall and moved with a terrifying speed. I ran as fast as I could, but the sticky wave caught up, sweeping me off my feet. A firefighter said that the molasses flowed like a river carrying debris and people and animals with it. It was like wading through a sea of tar. Trolley cars were lifted off the tracks and thrown aside. A, a structurally sound brick building was reduced to rubble in mere moments. Once the river of molasses subsided, that warm, thick syrup started to freeze on that cold January morning. It thickened around everything it covered. Bodies were wrapped up like sugary treats. 
21 people lost their lives. They were crushed or drowned by the molasses. Dozens of horses perished. 150 people were injured, some permanently. Can you all imagine being caught in a flood of molasses? I don't like getting gum on my shoes. It's all sticky and messy. So let me ask a question. Was this great molasses disaster of 1990, was it a black swan event or a gray rhino? Was it unpredictable or was it predictable? Turns out there were plenty of warning signs. In the weeks before the explosion, nearby residents reported hearing strange noises and low rumbling sounds. Some claimed to see cracks forming in the steel, the steel structure. Imagine living next to a 2.1 million gallon tank of molasses and you see the leaking and smell the aroma. You know it's coming. Hey, Martha, that thing's about to blow. Maybe we should go. Nah, it'll never happen. Then that day comes and the tank blows. <coughs> but that explosion unpredictable or predictable? It was very predictable. We just didn't know when. Here's the problem. We like to live our lives like nothing bad is ever going to happen, and then it does. But God gives us warning after warning after warning. The reality is almost every tragic event is predictable. People, they like to live their lives in denial. You just, we, we kind of hope that the bad things won't happen to us, and then they do. See, what happens is when you live in denial long enough, you become blind to almost everything. But as Christians, are we supposed to be smarter than that? Jesus told us, in this world, you will have trouble. How does he know? Because he went through trouble and overcame it. Jesus warned us, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And we fall for the false prophets all the time. I think the founding fathers were brilliant when they had elections every two years. You can laugh at that one. <laughs> And you know, Jesus wasn't very subtle when he said, for nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. That's old English for various. God sends his warnings, but without a relationship with him, we never see the sign of trouble until it's too late, do we? The reality is very few things in our lives come as a surprise. The roof is leaking, but I don't do ladders, so I'll put a bucket under the drip. My old truck is making a terrible clunking sound, but it's the only vehicle I have. They're laying off people at work, but I've got seniority. You feel that tightness in your chest, and you're thinking, must have been my Mexican lunch. Or you've got repeated arguments at home over and over over the same issue, but you'd rather just keep the peace. If you don't have a prayer life with God, you're like an Oklahoma town in tornado season. You know the destruction is coming. If you live in Galveston Bay during hurricane season, you know eventually destruction is coming. But God's gracious. 
He's always giving us a warning before he sends judgment. Scripture is filled with lesson after lesson of people who were given warnings. You know, we're supposed to be living our lives for God's glory. But we seem to be living a lot for our own glory. God's going to give us warnings. He gives us warnings when it's time to prepare. That's called prudence. God will give us a warning when it's time to fix what we can. That's called repentance. God will give us a warning when it's time to make amends. That's called reconciliation. God will give us a warning when it's time to seek guidance. That's called wisdom. God will give us a warning when it's time to protect the ones we love. That's called stewardship. And God will always give a warning when it's time to strengthen our faith in Christ because that's called devotion. Thanks, Pastor, but I got bigger problems. You see, I'm already caught up in a storm. What about me? Now, what I want to say to that person is, why did you ignore the warnings? But when someone's caught up in a storm, that's not a very nice, consoling thing to say. So what I will say to those people that are struggling in the storms in their lives is that stop paying attention to the storm. You remember that story of Jesus? He's on the boat, and they're going across the lake, and a storm comes up out of nowhere, and the disciples are all frantic. Ah, the storm! Mark 4, chapter, Mark chapter 4 has that story. It says, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, you don't care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? Who here loves that expression, Jesus saves? You ever have that bumper sticker on your car? Jesus saves, I know some of you did. The t-shirt, Jesus saves. But then you find yourself in a storm and you forget who's in the boat with you. Most of us, like you know, we like to think that we got the faith like Peter. We're just strutting through our life, our Christianity, and we're walking on top of the water and what happens, that storm hits. And we get distracted by the waves and the water and we start to drown. And what do we say? Jesus, save me. I want to shift, get, shift my gears here for a moment. I want you to start thinking about the storms in your life as an opportunity to be transformed. I want you to start looking at the the tumult and the chaos and the things that are coming up in your lives as, a, as an opportunity to have a life-changing experience. Stop drowning. Ignore the storm. I want you to realize that when Peter was walking along in the water and he sank, he said, you have little faith. He pulled him up as an example for all the disciples that Jesus saves. When they were on that boat, you think the storm just happened to come up? It was an illustration to those disciples, I can calm every storm. You're in the boat with me, I will save you. 
You might be right in the middle of a storm right now and you have no idea that God put you there on purpose. You might be right in the middle of a storm in your life and it has nothing to do with you. Think about what the Apostle Paul said about storms. He was literally the master of writing storms and getting through the storms. And he says that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. God is working for our good. And who have been called according to his purpose. We've been called for a purpose. Paul also told us this next one, and I think this is the one we really need to take away today, is we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has plans to use you for something. God formed you for a reason. God's been grooming and training every single one of you, every day of your life to be ready for that storm so that he can use you for his purpose. You think you were just born to be an entity? God has a reason for every single one of you. And sometimes it's during the storm when he needs you the most. Isn't that exactly what happens in the Bible? If you open the the book, you're going to see story after story of of people who were in the storms of their lives, and God changes the world with them. Moses, he killed an Egyptian. He's living in fear in the desert for 40 years, in exile. (coughs) He's in that storm of uncertainty. God uses him to rescue the nations of Israel. Joseph, he lived in that storm of being betrayed by his brothers and then unfairly persecuted. And God pulls him out of that storm and says, save the world from famine. David, no one knew who David was, the little shepherd out in the field, fighting off the lions and the bears, protecting his sheep, and God plucks him out and has him kill Goliath. Esther, what a storm she was in, torn from Jerusalem, taken out to exile. And God uses her and her storm to rescue the Jewish people from genocide. Rahab, she was in the storm of prostitution. And God used her to save the Israeli spies and Ruth. She was in that storm of starvation and deprivation. And what did God do with her? Not much. Just rescued her so she could start the line of David and Jesus. If you're caught in a storm in life, maybe you shouldn't be crying for help. Maybe instead you should be like Eli and and, uh, Moses and Elijah. And you're saying, here I am, Lord. Maybe you should be like Samuel. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Maybe the storm that you're in isn't about you at all. Maybe you're in that storm so God can work through you to rescue others. I want to close this morning by finishing my story about the great molasses disaster of 1919. You see, it turned out on that morning of the explosion, there was an Irish immigrant there named John Kelly. Kelly had spent decades fighting the prejudice and the animosity of his Irish heritage, and he, he worked his way up through the ranks of that facility. Over the years, he slowly learned all the the inner workings of the control panel and how all the flows of molasses and how all that stuff worked. And on that morning of January 15, 1919, when that tank blew and those millions of gallons flowed out in the streets, he jumped into action.
He was at the control panel, and he diverted the majority of that 2.1 million of masses away from the population. 21 lives were lost. It would have been thousands. And then, after he does this, he goes out into the streets. He's wading through the mud and, or the crog up to his knees, and he's rescuing people. He's pulling them to safety. John Kelly was in the storm of his life and his experience, those decades and decades of training he had made him an instrument for God to save people. The newspaper accounts later described Kelly's heroic efforts as being critical in saving hundreds if not thousands of lives. You know, if Kelly could have done what all the other ones were doing, I'm out of here. he didn't. He said, here I am, Lord, use me. See, John Kelly's story is the kind of story that it challenges us to step up and act with courage and kindness and trusting that God is using us as an instrument for him in whatever storm we find ourselves in. Sometimes the storm isn't about you. But don't think for a moment you don't need to stand watch. Storms are coming. We're all anxious for the Lord to return, but too many of us aren't even ready for the storms that come first. God wants us to use these little storms that he puts in our lives so we can learn how to be one with him. You can't say that I'm going to lean on the yoke of Jesus if you've never had the lean on the yoke of Jesus. So when it feels like you're weighing over your head and that storm is just pushing you back and you're pinned against the wall, you're going under and under and under, stop paying attention to the storm and trust in God. Jesus does say that we have to do our part first. Paul told us how. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Folks, everyone here knows storms are coming. You all been around way too long not to know what you see on the horizon. God continues to send more warnings than we deserve. Let us stand ready to serve with whatever skills, whatever knowledge, whatever gifts that God has delivered us so that we could go into that battle for him and for his kingdom. He's trained you. He's prepared you. He wants you to be ready to serve for his glory. But of all that training and preparation, it's all lost if you fall asleep on the watch. We cannot be like those virgins that let their oil lamps go dry. You have to stay ready. And you have to know that God's using you for a purpose, not putting you in a funny place. To you, I say to everyone, keep watch. If you're truly servants of the Lord, our Lord and what? Savior, Christ Jesus, he tells you, he commands you to keep watch. Let us respond to this great calling that we have. And that's what this is. When we're asked to step up in the middle of our storm, that's a calling to us to be bigger than we are. That's when you surrender fully your lives to the Lord and say, here I am. May we walk in the good works he's prepared for us. Let us be brave during every storm. Because you're God's masterwork. May we live each day humble in obedience to his will. 
bringing glory to his name. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder that not every storm is about us, and that no matter how dark the clouds may be, you're ever present. And that when we find ourselves in a storm, that we should always be looking to you to find the salvation, to find our strength, to find our hope, because we know you're not done with us yet, Lord. You're looking for us to step up and serve your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.